everybody. This is Rob Kane to goldsilverpros.com. It is Tuesday, November 9th, 2021. And I have a wonderful video for you guys today. It's gold and silver. This time it's different and how it's different in the new monetary system. I'm going to be telling you why you need to know this. What is the problem? The problem is we have a new monetary system. Most people aren't prepared for it. I'm going to explain exactly how that works. And I'm also going to give you solutions to how to address it. Now we're going to do this in a couple of parts. So for the YouTube viewers, we're going to describe the main parts of the system, as it were. For those of you supporting us on Patreon, we're going to do an extended version where we're going to talk about what the new monetary system will look like. And then also for those that are supporting us on Patreon as well, I'm going to give you my opinions on exactly how to deal with it. So if you guys have not uh, signed up to, to support us on Patreon, you guys might want to think about doing this. This is going to be a big piece. It's going to be explaining the big overarching picture of how gold and silver are going to play in this new system, what the new system is and what you can do about it. Also, for those of you interested on Thursday, I'm going to be talking about this in short form version for about 20, 25 minutes at the OTC markets presentation. So I wanted to invite you guys to that. We're going to be talking in front of thousands of investors who invest in stocks on the OTC. I believe there's about 15,000 stocks on the OTC that trade here in the U.S., it's the Critical and Precious Metals Investor Conference. You can go to virtualinvestorconferences.com and find it, and you can sign up for this. I will be on the second day, which is Thursday, November 11th, the kickoff speaker, and tell the presentation, the case for gold and silver this time. It's different, similar talk, but remember, if you want to get the, uh, the recommendations and what I think is really going to happen and how you can deal with that, uh, support us on Patreon and, and you'll get that content over the next 24 hours. So we're going to go straight to the presentation, guys, without further ado. One of the things that I wanted to note before we get to the presentation is I was asked on Twitter about this from a gentleman who said, Rob, actually, he kind of said, Rob, you need to talk about Basel III, not to talk about CDBCs and all this other stuff. And I pointed out we have been talking about it. I did six videos on Basel III, numerous videos on CBDCs. I wrote about CBDCs for our website subscribers back in 2018 on goldsilverpros.com when nobody was talking about CDBCs. I was like first or second on the scene. I think it was me and Lynette Zane, the only ones talking about it, you know, in the social media verse and the alternative media verse. And, but then I said, you know what? He probably just wants an update on what's going on. So this video is in response to our Twitter followers who asked us to do an update on all of that stuff. And I'm gonna tie in CDBCs, Basel III, gold, silver, and the whole thing into the presentation. Here we go. So the name of the presentation, gold, silver, this time it's different. And let's go ahead and get the presentation started. So I want to start with talking about the market. Why the market? Why the S&P 500? Because the S&P 500 is a great predictor of what's going on with the central banking system and the monetary system because they're tied at the hip. Why? Because the Fed prints a bunch of money and it goes into the stock market. It is what the system controllers want you to see as representative of how the economy actually is. Now, we spend a lot of time talking on the channel about how that's not actually how the economy is going and that this is overvalued and it's a mirage in, in many ways, which has happened throughout history, as you can see in the charts I'm about to show you. And that's true, but it's a good analog for talking about when this monetary system resets. And then I'll bring gold and silver into that later. So uh, we're looking from standard and poor's, the S&P ratios, that is the price to earnings. So it's a market cap divided by the earnings. It tells you how much you're paying for that stock over how much they actually earn. It's a multiple. So the higher the multiple, the more expensive the stock is for every dollar earned, that allows you to compare different companies in the same industry or even different industries against one another. So as you can see here, and I'll, I'll give you a number that's not on the slide, but during the Great Recession, I think we hit a high in the 120s for the P to E ratios. Well, in 2021, we started at a low of 128 to 20 you can see in March on this left-hand chart. Then we went to 138, and then 148, and then 158, then 164, then 169, 174. As of October, the latest data available as of October 29, 2021, as you see here, was 180.21. That's why it's got the red circle. The S&P Standard Poor's expects it in November, an expected value of 185.59. That's an estimate. And an estimate in December for 190.98. Okay, great. In other words, we're way above the stock market valuations that we saw from a price to earnings uh, ratio perspective than we saw during the Great Recession. So not only are we overvalued, we're another almost 50%. I mean, it went from like 127 to 180. It's another 40 something percent overvaluation. 
So just from a price to earnings ratio, we're overvalued. One of the things that some guys found out, uh, Graham, the value, famous value investor, David Dodd and uh, Robert Schiller figured out was you have to look at something called the PE over 10. The PE over 10 is the price to earnings ratio uh, compared with the 10 year average uh, earnings because when they do what doing that eliminates anomalies in the data, like a one day spike, a news event, certain uh, business cycle events. So PE over 10 is a better reliable indicator. So we're not going to just use PE. We're going to use PE over 10. The PE over 10 is also called the CAPE, the cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratio. It's a better indicator, which allows you to compare different time periods because of changes in the underlying financial system, how overvalued the stock market is. I'm not going to get into all the details of that. Just kind of trust me on that. The research is out there if you want to look at it. So from advisorperspectives.com, wonderful website that had this article uh, early November, November 3rd, which is talking about the PE 10, it's based on real monthly averages of daily closes divided by the 10 year average of real earnings. The horizontal bands show the quintile breakdown of the PE 10. Quintile will become important. Quintile is a fifth, so 20%, 40%, 60%, 80%, 100. And he's added a regression showing the mean. The regression is a mean line or what the average is over time for the whole data series. And I'll explain what that means in a minute. So the mean tells you where the average value should be, or it tells you what a reasonable value is over time. So as you look at these red lines, this is a reasonable value on price. This is a reasonable value on PE 10. So what's in this right-hand chart? This is the price of the stock market over, over time. The price is 178% over the mean or the average. So we're really high on the price of the stock market. People talk about the price all the time, but it's not just the price, it's the cash they're throwing off. What's the PE ratio and specifically the CAPE or the PE 10, the price to earnings over a 10 year period rolling. So if you look at that on the bottom, you get this line, we're still 80% above regression. That means we're in the fourth quintile or yes, quintile, uh, 20, 40, 60, 80%. And if you go one more percent, you're in the fifth quintile. That's important because as you get closer to 100, the probability of you snapping back and, and, and the market crashing down below the mean value gets extremely high. It's high in the fourth quintile at 80% right here, PE over 10. When you get to the, to the, to the last quintile, 81 to 100%, then it almost guarantees you're going to have a massive crash. And when it crashes, it crashes back down below the mean into the, a lot of times in the single digits, meaning big, big crashes. You look on the bottom of the chart, 1900, we had a 25.2 PE 10, and then it fell down to a 4.8. Then in 1930, the height of the, the stock market before the big you know, crash uh, preceding the Great Recession, 32.6, it fell down to a single digit 5.6. Then you had a 22.2 uh, before the World War, and then it fell down to like a 9.1. Then in the 70s, you had 24.1, fell down to a 6.6. 2000, the tech crash, it was 44.2. All-time valuations, this uh, uh, overinflation of the tech sector fell down to 13.3. Now we're at a 37.4. Uh, I think it'll rise into the final quintile before it crashes. So we're going to have one more melt-up. I'll show you why here in a minute. And then it's going to crash again. So we're getting closer. This is another way to, to measure how close we are to the stock market crash, looking at history and looking at the standard that, that economists look at for how you determine how the stock market's overvalued, PE over 10 or the CAPE. And then, again, this is done by some very smart people, Robert Schiller, David Dodd, and Benjamin Graham over time as they looked at it. So the historical standard deviation. So we're going to look at standard deviations. Let me explain standard deviation for those of you in statistics. You have a mean, which is the, the center number. And then as you move out a standard deviation, either below or above that, that number, you get the bulk of the results. And as you move out another standard deviation, you get less results until finally the third standard de deviation has most of the results. So in other words, about, I think it's about 96 to 98% of all expected results in any mathematical uh, data set is expected to fall on three standard deviations of the middle. So the middle could be five. And then within three standard deviations on either side, you know, two, three, and four, you're gonna find the bulk, bulk of the results. And then you might find some outliers beyond three standard deviations. But in other words, as you get to the third standard deviation from the mean, either high or low, that signals a reversal is coming. So let's see on this chart how many standard deviations we were when we had a crash. Look at the, the crash preceding the Great Depression. 89%, you were in the between the second and third standard deviation. You were approaching an extreme value from, from the price to earning ratio of the stock market from where it traditionally has been. And then you had a crash down to negative 68%. It reverted back through the mean to way below what it had ever been. 
And this is where JP Morgan said, buy when there's blood in the streets. When it was negative 68%, when it was so undervalued, the stock market was so undervalued according to historical means, price to earnings ratios, price of stock you pay for what they actually make. When that number fell so low, it was buy when there's blood in the streets. And this is when a lot of uh, Wall Street tycoons were made back then. Well, a couple of, the only uh, one other time is it blown through the second standard deviation into the third. And that was the, the tech crisis. You see on the previous chart, tech crisis, 44.2, the highest value on PE10. So we go, it was the highest standard deviations away from the mean. That's just another way to look at it. 157%, it was way overvalued according to historical norms for the market. What people thought was, was good. Well, what happened? It crashed down to the negative 23%. It had a big crash you know, after the tech crisis. It did rise up until about 2008, 2009 and then fell back down. So this took basically two recessions for this to play out. From the tech crash and then the mortgage crisis, it fell to negative 23%. Well, in only 13, 12 to 13 years since the last, since the Great Recession, the big you know, financial collapse, the Lehman event, the mortgage market, 2008, 2009, we're back up now to 117%. We're knocking on the door of this third standard deviation. Could go back to the previous chart. Knocking on the door, same number, just a different chart. We're 37.4, third standard deviation, fifth quintile of the data, you know, highest percentage of the data where you know you're really overvalued, we're sitting right there. What does that mean? We're closer to the crash. Two different measures, the quintile and the standard deviation, two mathematical measures, we're really close to where this thing should crash. Now, could it go back up through the third standard deviation into the fifth quintile to the 90% overvaluation? Well, let's see this chart. If you look at PE10's ratios by percentile to see how much it's overvalued according to the historic mean over time, the stock market, you look at the only thing that has been worse was uh, the tech bubble. The tech bubble had the higher over, highest overvaluation. We see that in the chart here of the PE10 ratio, the CAPE ratio. Price to earnings were at all time high. Stocks were the most expensive to the money they actually earned during the tech crisis. Well, there was a crash. Right now, we're right here at 98.4%. So we're actually higher now than the 1929 peak preceding the Great Depression and the 2007 peak preceding the Great Recession. So we're almost where we were during the tech crisis when we had that big crash. And I lost 40% of my Janus stocks Janus funds that were supposed to be great. And I learned never to invest in mutual funds and ETFs after that during the tech crisis. We're almost to that point. So will we get to the point of overvaluation of the stock market like we were in 2000 in the tech crisis? Or will we go past it this time before it crashes? Or will it crash before that? I don't know. I just know if you look at all the data around what the experts say is the best way to measure overvaluation of the stock market, we're sitting right there with the worst crashes in history, right there with the, one of the, the worst. Okay, and we don't have far to go. So any day now in the next six months, one year, two years, this thing could turn over and just bam. And we don't know what it's gonna be this time, but we know from a milestone perspective, from looking at these charts, we're pretty damn close, okay? That's why in the second half of the presentation, when I go on for the people that support us on Patreon, that are members and support us uh, that way, I'm gonna go on to talk about what you do when that actually happens. What does that all mean? So again, Benjamin Graham, David Dodd, Robert Schiller, over time analyzed the PE and decided we need PE uh, over 10 years of earnings data uh, annualized. And they gave us a PE 10 or, or the CAPE, the cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratio, CAPE, C-A-P-E. It's shown the calculation of the PE ratio over 10 year average to reduce a distortion of temporary swings in the business cycle and to allow for longer term comparisons of stock valuations over different periods of time. That's how we can compare now back to uh, the Great Depression or back to the tech crisis or back to any event dating to 1871, which was on that original chart that we looked at. Translated, what does that mean? We got one more market melt up left coming and then it all comes crashing down. Boom, bam, slam, crash. You know, all those, uh, <laughs> those things you see in the old uh, Batman comics of the old uh, Batman uh, TV show, the 60s TV show where it's like, bam, crash. That's what's going to happen in the stock market. So what goes up when markets go down? Gold and then silver. Gold pops and then silver goes parabolic. Silver goes up as a higher percentage than gold does when the stock market crashes, but gold also goes up, okay? So that's what we're talking about here. Let's talk a little bit about that. I've talked so much on the channel about 
we're getting close and people are asking me when. And I said, I don't, I can't give you exact dates. Now, even Nostradamus can't pick exact dates. And, and in the study of longer term events over time, you never pick exact dates. They, they don't matter. You pick milestones. You look at milestones. Where are you? Where are you going? Back when we had the big financial crash in 2008, 2009, I ended up losing my consulting job with EY. I wrote the book, the first thing I ever wrote, Drop Shadow. It's because I saw some, si some of the inside of the industry because I worked I was doing a consulting engagement in mortgage services, and I saw the subprime crisis up front. I saw the data on 50,000 loans on, on a company that went out of business long before Lehman ever had trouble. And we were trying to save that thing for Morgan Stanley, who bought this loan portfolio, and get Morgan Stanley in the black, and also get the loan service correctly. For, for I ran that whole engagement. I had 50 people working for me on there. And I was managing that for Ernst Young and for Morgan Stanley. And we got it on track. We got that loan portfolio on track. So I actually had real world experience in mortgage servicing on one of the largest subprime portfolios, 50,000 loans, or one, of the, one of the top ones during the middle of the crisis. So I saw all the crap that was going on. And then I saw the after effects because after that, after I left EY, or I was laid off from EY, I went to work for American Home Mortgage Servicing, which was the number one in the US subprime mortgage lender. Number one, it was the amalgamation of two previous companies that, that went defunct and came together and they jammed all this crap together. And they formed a new company and eventually it was owned by Wilbur Ross. And eventually he sold it to somebody. I think it went to Aquin or somebody to service these. And, but I saw it after I saw TARP and I saw all those programs the government tried to put out to fix it and how ridiculously stupid they were. And they didn't really work. I mean, it helped some people, but they really didn't. It helped the lenders more than it helped the borrowers. Let's just put it that way, in my opinion. Anyway, I saw that. So I understood what happened back then. That's why I wrote the book. And that's why I started writing for Seeking Alpha and got syndicated and eventually started Gold Silver Pros. That's what got me into Austrian economics and Gold Silver, all that stuff. So that experience had formed my view now, but since I'd have been studying the market and, we're, and we look at how the market works, and now I recognize these milestones. And that's why I'm, I'm talking about them with you today. We have these milestones. They're important. You know, the milestones I just showed you are telling you we're right there. The other stuff about what the new system is going to be. And that's what I'm going to talk about next for those that support us on Patreon. Uh, those of you who do that, go over to, you know, your patreon.com forward slash goals or pros log in and you'll get the rest of this conversation. We're going to talk about um, the, the second part of the presentation, which is basically what the new arch architecture is going to be. I'm going to talk again about Basel III. I'm going to talk about the CDBCs. I'm going to talk about negative interest rates and how all in modern monetary theory and how all this stuff comes together. Okay, we talked about it before, but I've got the grand picture. And then I'm going to talk about what you can do. Okay, it's not just owning the shiny, although that's a large part of it. It's other things that you can do. And that may be the most important part of the conversation. So I wanted to thank you guys for stopping by the YouTube channel. Wanted to put this together for the gentleman that asked on Twitter. You asked and you shall receive. We want to be responsive to our community, give you an update on what's going on, give you some new research on the the CAPE ratio, the PE10, and how that's our biggest milestone for when that stock market's going to likely crash, at least one of the best ones. And then we're going to give you some solutions for those that stick around um, you know, to that and, and what the new architecture is going to be. So stay tuned, guys. If you're uh, on Patreon supporting us there, we're going to go over the rest of the presentation. For those of you who want a little bit more, join us at the OTC conference uh, this Thursday in the morning where I give the morning keynote uh, for the OTC markets. And you can see a little bit more of this presentation as well. Uh, go sign up. Thank you guys so much for watching today's video. We appreciate it. Please remember to like, subscribe, and share, and hit that notification button so you get those notifications when new content comes out. If you like what we're doing here, please consider supporting us on Patreon. Those members of Patreon will get extra special content delivered to them as well.